Welcome, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us for tonight's presentation. Uh, we're going to be doing a bit of a deep dive on the pending new NCAA scholarship limits and what it means for your recruiting journey specifically. We'll start off just by introducing ourselves. Uh, my name is Mike. I'm a senior recruiting analyst here at Sports Accrued. So a lot of what I do with the student athletes that I work with is giving them additional support throughout the recruiting process, whether that be help with communication with coaches, video support, you know, uh, anything that really kind of comes into play whenever they are looking to make that next step when it comes to recruiting. That's really what I'm trying to assist with. Um, and a big discussion that has come up in recent uh, recently with a lot of things coming out of the NCAA is how that's going to affect potential scholarship opportunities, particularly if you're interested interested in NCAA Division One sports. So really excited to walk everyone through that tonight. Awesome. I'm Caroline. You probably, most of you have heard from me via email about um, you know, different membership options that we offer at Sports Recruits. I work with families, helping them get started on the platform, walking you through how to really leverage your profile. In this presentation, we're going to cover um, a couple pieces to how the platform works, but we offer a wide range of upgrade options for families to choose from, depending on how hands-on you want us to be in this process. At the end, I will also walk you through those options. I went to Penn State, worked with their women's soccer program while I was there, worked at U.S. Soccer after Penn State, working with the youth national teams, and then made my way over to sports recruits about five years ago. So love working with families, love helping families understand the recruiting process. And I'm, you know, quite frankly, excited to hear what Mike has to say. Uh, this is a huge change that's coming down the pipeline with the NCAA. So we've got some good content coming through. Yeah. And uh, a fun fact for everyone watching, me and Caroline actually started the same month five years ago, way back when. So we've, we've kind of started our sports recruit journey from the beginning together. So it's exciting <laughs> that we're this meeting here tonight. Five uh, more years. <laughs> five more, exactly. But uh, for what you guys actually want to learn about today, the NCAA settlement, we'll flirt, we're first going to start off with just breaking down what some of the changes that were announced just about, uh, I think, three weeks, four weeks ago that came directly from the NCAA uh, in terms of like a widespread look of what that settlement is potentially going to change. We're really going to be specifically focusing on roster limits and how that's going to be different from the current scholarship model that all Division One sports are in as of right now. Uh, we then are going to show everyone what those new roster limits are going to be in all varsity sports. So everyone will be able to take a look at that. Um, also, probably a good time to uh, to mention if you are watching it live tonight, we are going to be sending a recording of this at some point tomorrow. So if you don't have a chance to screenshot something or you want us to you know, review something, you will have the ability to go back and watch this later on as well. Um, and then the last thing I'll be covering with all of you will be just the impact that this is going to have on how schools potentially are going to be using their scholarships moving forward. From there, we'll pass it over to Caroline, and she's really going to give us a better understanding of how to best utilize sports recruits and also how we can help in trying to navigate the recruiting process as a whole, specifically if you are looking to, uh, you know, gather more interest from those Division One programs that could potentially have more scholarships available starting next year. Um, yeah, and I just I just dropped into the chat a link to schedule a call. That's usually the best way to get in touch. Just book a time on my calendar and we'll walk through it together. So feel free to grab that link. I'll send it over again at the end. Perfect. And we'll have some other links we've thrown in there in terms of articles that we've written, direct announcements from the NCAA. So we'll make sure all of that is accessible uh, throughout the presentation as well. Uh, so yeah, so let's get into it. Let's first break down the ongoing NCAA settlement. And first and foremost, the way that, that the NCAA broke it down is they really, they really gave us three pillars of major changes that they anticipate to happen, particularly starting in the fall of 2025. Uh, so the first thing that a lot of you have probably seen on the news is that people who had or missed out on NIL opportunities starting in 2018 are actually going to be receiving back pay for those potential lost wages that they were able to not access at that point in time. So the figure that they were able to come up with was around $2.78 billion, and that's going to be paid back to student athletes over a 10-year period. They have a model, they have a, like a mathematical equation they put together to determine how much each player is going to ultimately receive. But with that model, it is very based on the revenue the sports generate and social media activity, among some other factors. So it's estimated that about 83% of that money will go to football and men's basketball players. You know, as we know, in terms of like the amount of people who are watching those sports, you have Mark Madness that really generates a lot of money for the NCAA. That is where a majority of the money is going to be going back to in terms of those student athletes who play those particular sports. 
Um, the other piece, it's increased NIL benefits, but even on top of that, rather than just making money for your name, image, and likeness as a student athlete, it also is going to start a new world where student athletes are actually going to be getting paid directly from their colleges for the very first time. It's a monumental change if, uh, in regards to the NCAA and college sports altogether. In, within the last few years, NIL was something that gave student athletes the opportunity to earn money based on their own marketing campaigns, partnering with different companies, things of that nature. Now you are essentially going to be getting some sort of a salary from the school that you are currently going to be a part of. Um, it's estimated that as of right now, for the schools that do decide to opt into this change, um, is going to be estimated that around 20 to $22 million is going to be spread across all of, all of the athletes that are on that particular on that particular program, on the particular athletic program, I should say. So not specifically just one team. We'll get into the ins and outs of like expectations of how that money will be divvied up, uh, maybe at a later date. But most important thing for those who are in the class of 2025 or younger, which is probably everyone on this meeting, if you end up at a division one school, there is the potential that you could be receiving money on top of NIL, also be receiving some sort of like addi additional funds from the school based on the revenue that they're generating year over year. Uh, and the last one, and what's really going to be taking up the brunt of what we wanted to focus on tonight is the elimination of scholarship limits. So what that means for those who don't know is as of right now, every sport in the NCAA has some sort of limit of the amount of scholarships that those that, that the student athletes can receive in each individual sport. Uh, for example, the one that comes up a lot because the once one of the sports that get like very excited about this change is specifically involving baseball where they can have a roster of 25, 30 people, somewhere around there, but they're only able to provide 11.7 scholarships across the entire roster. That means some people may get 25% and some people may get 50%, but that overall number is going to turn into 11.7. That is now removed. Now the way it's going to work is the NCAA Division I programs that opt into this, you'll have a number of athletes that you can have on a specific team, and it's going to be up to each school to determine how many scholarships they would like to provide to those student athletes at that point. So the limitation is no longer going to be based on the scholarship aid, is going to be based on the amount of players that an overall team could have. Um, this is going to be this is going to be something that's going to make some major changes. Uh, and I think the big thing to really keep in mind is that, yes, it is more potential scholarship opportunities, but it's not a requirement for these schools to offer full ride scholarships through an entire roster. So that's something we'll get into in a little bit more. And the one thing that we also want to mention as well is that this is all pending as of right now. Nothing is set in stone. This is going to be done in the courts for a very long time. Um, in the NCAA settlement uh, article that came out at, regarding this, they said they expect this to take several months before any of this uh, actually becomes official. But we want to make sure with the information that we're gathering that you guys are you know, in a position where you're going to be the most up-to-date and most knowledgeable about these changes that could directly affect how you're going through the recruiting process as it stands right now. So the next hearing that is scheduled is for September 5th. We don't know if that's necessarily going to mean some of this stuff will be finalized or not, but just make sure you uh, you check back and you follow us and because we'll continue to post articles and continue to post webinars if there is additional information that we feel like is worthy of, you know, gathering all of your attention here. So uh, if there are questions that pop up about this, feel free to utilize the Q&A in the chat box. We'll do our best to get to as many of those after the meeting, but just wanted to first lay out more than anything what some of those major changes that we do anticipate with that settlement going into effect at some point soon. Um, from there, we'll talk about, you know, really the difference between roster limits. I kind of touched on this already a little bit, but the biggest things for everyone here to know is roster caps for each sport are going to be determined by the average team uh, and, the, and the size specific to that sport. And every athlete for the first time ever is also going to be eligible to receive a scholarship. Now, being eligible doesn't mean a guarantee, but just know that if you are on a Division I program, there is going to be the potential and there's no longer going to be the explanation from a coach saying they can't based on NCAA rules. That's going to be more so based on the athletic departments and the overall budget that they're going to be able to provide each individual sport that that, team, that, that particular athletic department uh, you know, oversees. Um, so they'll determine how much athletic aid each athlete receives. So that means in terms of like a head count sport, when you are someone who is going to be a full rider bust, that is also not going to be part of the scholarship model anymore. Uh, a sport like football, for example, there was, you know, 85 scholarships that you were able to receive. All 85 players on that roster were able to receive a full ride. That was the way that that particular sport was set up. Uh, women's volleyball was also in that in that world as well. Now there are is going to be partial scholarships available across the board if that's the way that the athletic department chooses to do that. 
Um, in terms of who's going to get the most benefit from something like this, I referenced baseball before, and you'll see on the graph that we're going to show in just a second here, the difference that really is going to be, that is going to, you're going to see a significant change in terms of what that roster limit means in terms of the amount of potential scholarships in some of these sports. Uh, something that is a little unclear is football. They did receive a scholarship, in, a roster limit increase, meaning there's more scholarships available, but it's going to be unclear in terms of how that's going to handle walk-ons. Walk-ons is a really big part of football as a sport. There might be 10, 15 players who aren't on scholarship, maybe even more in some instances. Now it's going to be unclear if you hit that roster limit with all of the scholarships, what does that mean moving forward if someone did want to try and walk on to that team? So again, we're in the infant stages of a lot of these things happening. We just want to make clear that a lot of this stuff is ongoing and we'll try and report back as soon as a lot of it's a lot more of it is finalized at some point in the near future. And then next up, we'll just go through those roster limits. So the way that this is formatted is you are going to see the biggest increases starting at the top left, where we're going to work all the way down to the bottom right, which is going to show the, the, the least amount of increase in terms of what those old limits are. So the old limit graphic is actually showing you what the scholarship limit was for that particular sport. The new limit is going to actually identify what the new roster limit is going to be. So again, taking baseball as the example, 11.7 scholarships were divvied up to the 25, 30, 35 or so athletes that may have been on a roster in previous years. Now, with that overall roster limit being 34, that's a potential increase of 22.3 scholarships that could be available to Division I baseball players. So I'll give everyone an extra second or two here if you wanted to try and find your sport. Again, feel free to take a screenshot. We'll also make this available to you at some point tomorrow. Um, but just to get an idea of what sports are most going to see an impact potentially, because again, this is a limit. It's not a requirement. Some schools may decide if they don't want to invest a ton of resources in stunt or rowing or tumbling, as you see at the top of the screen here, it may stay the same in terms of the amount of scholarships that are available. Or you actually may even see some of the, uh, less scholarships being offered to some of those programs too. So it is a little bit of a double-sided coin in that respect, but really a major reason for this change was to try and provide more scholarship opportunities for student athletes across the board. Cool, awesome. Um, and as we just kind of continue going here, so how can this impact how schools utilize those scholarships moving forward? So again, as we've kind of touched on a few times here, it increases the overall amount of opportunities that could be out there. Um, the roster limit prevents some of those, you know, big brand schools, let's take the Alabamas, the USC's, these places that have, you know, essentially unlimited wealth uh, between boosters and everything that they have going on within the program they're not gonna be able to load up and have 200 football players on their team or something to that effect. So it still is gonna limit some stockpiling that could potentially happen. Um, and also the support, if you are in a revenue sport like football and basketball is only going to go up even more at this point in time. Uh, they're in a position where, you know, those two sports were really making it, were generating a ton of revenue and wealth for the school and for the NCAA. So they're probably, we, we assume, and our expectation is that those sports are gonna receive even more resources coming from that school. Um, in terms of the, you know, the other side of it, some potential disadvantages, this may limit the amount of full ride scholarships college coaches may decide to offer. Um, that could be based on the athletic department telling them that they want to try and get as many people to receive aid. So if you were someone who was hoping for a full ride, there is a possibility that might not be as available. Um, we noted about football, walk-on opportunities may be limited because colleges may be more inclined to have every person on their roster receiving some sort of scholarship moving forward. Um, and then last up, non-revenue sports is someone that could be in a little bit of trouble. Again, this is all pending. It's an expectation. We don't have an exact science of understanding how colleges are going to handle those sports. But more often than not, what we expect is that colleges are going to have to make a decision on which sports they're going to invest more resources in, which means there's going to be some sports that may be left behind in some way, shape, or form. That could be, you know, um, less availability for coaches, maybe not having as many positions available, a decrease in funding because that money is going to have to get allocated somewhere, wherever that coach, wherever that athletic department has decided to really try and, you know, really make more of a significant change and a significant advantage whenever it comes to those sports that they are really looking to pour their resources in. Um, so hopefully that gives everyone a better idea of kind of what some of those options are. In terms of things that we don't know as of right now, Title IX is something that comes up pretty, you know, pretty commonly whenever you're talking about NCAA athletics. And for those who don't know, that's essentially just making sure that people are, you know, particularly on women's sports are going to be in a position where they're going to be able to get some sort of like fair and equal support, similar to the men's side of things. 
where it's unclear if there's going to be the same amount of scholarships available for men's and women's athletes. It's unclear if a sport like soccer, for example, where there's a men's team and a women's team, it's unclear if they're going to be in a position where they're going to have to offer the same amount of scholarships to both of those rosters equally. We understand that it is going to play a factor in a role in how this all plays out, but it is unclear as of right now how that is going to affect what this settlement turns into and what those new rules and regulations may be. Um, another expectation that we have based on the research that we've done and just looking into how these coaches are, and athletic departments are talking about it is schools are most likely going to be tiering their sports, meaning kind of like what I was saying before, there's going to be a position where they're going to have to really invest more resources into certain sports, which would mean that they would probably have to pull back in some other places. So the way that they would do that is by tiering. You're going to have your A1, A1 sports that are really going to get the backing of the athletic department then the schools following that may not have as many resources available for the reasons that we kind of outlined there. Um, there is some you know, discussion about not requiring schools to follow this new model. So there may be an opt out for some of these programs. So keep in mind, even if this does get passed and everything does kind of move forward, it may not, as of right now, it, it's not clear that it's going to be required for every school to have to follow this model. It may be something that's decided by conferences. So that's also something that's a bit up in the air. Um, and also, as of right now, we don't see anything in terms of how this may affect Division II and Division III programs regarding the scholarships that they're able to provide. Division II, very similar to that equivalency sport model that a lot of schools offer, where you have a number of scholarships that you can provide and then you're able to give people kind of partial scholarships to match up to whatever that number is for each sport where division three does not offer athletic based scholarships as it stands right now. So as of, from what we can tell that is going to remain unchanged, but as this is more of a division one settlement specifically, but just want to make it clear that there doesn't seem that there are going to be any changes at those two levels in particular, as of right now. Mike, we got a question that you may want to just hit on now. Yeah. On the topic, um, somebody was asking, will D3 or IV change rules based on this? I don't know if you have any insight into that. My my guess would be no, it won't be changing anything. They yeah, do. I would say the expectation is no. Um, right. And we can't really know for certain. Uh, you know, a, it's a fair point to bring up the Ivy League schools because they are division one level programs that really don't offer athletic based aid. Right. Typically, anyone who is receiving aid from the Ivy League school is going to be need based at that point meaning it's more so part of the financial aid process when you get to your senior year and you're filling out your college applications. Um, in, in terms of what I've seen or what it's, it's really going to be more of like an opinion that I would provide on that more than anything else, I would assume that it would kind of stick to status quo, meaning that they would not be providing athletic aid moving forward here. Maybe, you know, since those schools do have, uh, you know, a lot of backing and a lot of alumni, maybe there's just more of an NIL collective or NIL availability that could help those student athletes. So maybe they're not getting paid directly by the school, it's it's unclear. Maybe they end up getting paid once they are on campus, but in terms of scholarships, that's something that still is going to be unclear for now. Sure. Cool. Awesome. Great question, though, for sure. Um, but I believe that's everything that I wanted to go through with with everyone here tonight. Hopefully, that clarifies some of the you know confusion that is built around some of these new new roster limits more than anything else. Yeah. But I'm going to kick it over to Caroline. She she can talk a little bit more about how sports recruits can help you navigate this process moving forward. Yeah. And I mean, it's the same, same process that we talk about all the time. You know, what can you do as a student athlete and as a family to put yourself in a good position and across the board, being proactive is so important in a, in your recruiting process, not waiting for coaches to come to you, not waiting for coaches to make you a scholarship offer. You're the student athlete. You need to be in the driver's seat. You know, I talk to families all the time about, you know, how do I get a scholarship? What's our best chance of getting a scholarship? Starting your recruiting process early is really important. You have to think about it from a college coach's perspective. If a coach is able to watch you for several years and watch you grow and develop and, you know, really get a better sense for who you are as a student athlete, you're basically chipping away at getting on that coach's list. The higher you are on a coach's list, odds are the better scholarship opportunities that you might have access to. And, you know, it's, it's, likely going to be changing a lot with a, a school, you know, one school that you're talking to may have eight scholarships that they're able to split up into parts. Another school you're talking to may have 12 scholarships. So, you know, in terms of how sports recruits can help, Mike is one of our best recruiting analysts that we have at sports recruits, and he's working with families 
all, all the time, day in and day out to make sure you're in a good position um, as a student athlete. So we'll walk through some of the packages or the upgrade options in a little, but these, these bullet points here, being proactive, what does that mean? Update your profile regularly, treat it like a recruiting resume for yourself. It's your opportunity to paint a picture in a college coach's mind of who you are as a student athlete. You're changing, your grades are changing, you're going to events make it a habit of going back into your profile and updating that. Video is crucial. We say it all the time. It, I feel like a broken record sometimes. We have a stat on, on another slide that we share with families sometimes that coaches are actually 11 times more likely to contact you if you have video on your profile. Rule of thumb, a new highlight reel each season um, so coaches can see how you're developing. And with the communication with coaches, when you are updating your video or you are updating your profile, don't keep that to yourself. Make it a habit of going and sending out a round of emails to the schools on your list when you've got new info. Target list of schools. Um, you know, I would say, you know, it's the same same process as it was before. You know, the changes are at the Division One level, but, you know, you don't want to forget about your D2 and D3 schools that you're keeping in mind. But I think it it kind of goes to show if if everything's changing and some schools may not have as much scholarship, I would take that as uh, a hint to widen your search a little bit more and and pull some more schools onto your list. And then, like Mike said, we have Instagram, um, we have our blog. Make sure you're staying up to date on sports recruits updates. So this is a this is your profile on sports recruits. If some of you guys aren't familiar with it, this should be again your recruiting home base. Like I mentioned, profile picture, do a headshot, grad grad year, position, where you're from, video, all of that should be posted on your profile. Pretty self explanatory. It's really easy to use and it's really easy to update this. You can update it from your phone or from the computer, but really make sure that you post a picture uh, on there so coaches can recognize you in person. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. School search tool is, I, it's one of my favorite parts of sports recruits because, you know, depending on your sport, there could be, you know, over 1700 schools across the country uh, for you to choose from. That's really overwhelming. Using these filters here makes it a little bit more manageable. So say, you know, you want to go only, you know, up to four hours from home, or, you know, you want to try and play at one of these division one schools, use these filters and then when you're, you know, you're building your list of schools and you want to know more about a particular program, if you click into that school, you'll see a ton of information about the school itself. You'll also be able to see some other athletes that maybe use sports recruits and committed to that school. So you could check out their profile. But this is, you know, building a list of schools. We usually say around 20 to 30 schools when you favorite a school on sports recruits. It goes into your, your list. Coaches can't see the other schools that you're looking at. They can't see how many schools you have favorited. That is for you to stay organized. So don't be shy. Favorite all of the schools that you're interested in to give yourself the best shot. Coaches can see and they can filter for student athletes that are interested in their program specifically. So say I'm the coach at Boston University and I know that I need 2027 20, goalkeepers that are interested in my school and have at least a 3.5 GPA, I can filter for student athletes that are gonna meet that criteria. So just a couple tips there. And, and while we're on this topic too, about trying to find and build your target list of schools, I know a lot of what we're talking about is based on these division one changes that are gonna be going into play potentially, but even more so, it's even really more important to cast that wide net and have a variety of different programs as well. I know we touched a little bit on those D2 and D3 opportunities, but I think just really just want to stress the point home more than anything else. Don't put all of your eggs in one basket, but we're not necessarily saying not to pursue Division One programs. We just think it's really wise at this point to give yourself other opportunities, because at the very least, if they want to move forward or have a conversation with you a little bit faster than those D1 programs, it's just going to make you more prepared for how those conversations might go at the end of the day. Good point. Yeah. So, you know, we talk about being proactive, communicating with coaches. I hit on this already, but, you know, you never want, to, there's no such thing as um, playing hard to get in the recruiting process. You really need to be proactive in reaching out to these schools, especially if you haven't hit the, you know, specifically for division one and division two, if you haven't hit either that June 15th or that September 1st or August 1st date, 
coaches can't ask you for recruiting information. So you need to be the one to reach out to them. So it's almost like a one-sided conversation until that date hits, but a couple of bullet points here. Anytime you're going to an event, make sure you're contacting coaches, let them know where they can come see you play, um, give them your schedule, make it as easy as possible for these coaches that probably have 20 other kids that they're going to go watch at this event. Um, and then make sure that you're following up with them after the event, uh, whenever you update your uh, transcript or your GPA, your academic info, another reason to contact coaches, new video, pretty self-explanatory. Make sure coaches know that you've got new film for them to take a look at. And then further along in the recruiting process, setting up a phone call with them to learn more about their program or even setting up a visit. Those are all reasons you should contact these schools. And then we have the messaging system. If you have, <clears throat> if you already have the pro plan, you can use this. Um, and then again, I'll walk through the upgrade options um, in a in a second here. But the sports recruits messaging system, we have we already have all the college coaches on here. So when you're reaching out to your list of thirty odd schools, rather than going through the internet trying to find coaches' contact info. All you have to do is type in the name of the school. Their coaches will pop up. You type up what you type up what you want to say in the subject line, and then the body of the email, and it'll automatically link your profile. So it saves you a ton of time and stress going through trying to make sure you're reaching out to the right schools. But do make sure that you're proofreading before you send out these emails. Make sure you've got the right coach and you know who you're addressing and the right school coaches, you know, they really do read these emails. So make sure that you're putting your best foot forward there. Awesome. And it'll go to their sports recruits inbox and it'll go to their normal.edu. So you never have to worry that a coach isn't seeing your email. It would say Mike Babich uh, in the uh, sender. So they know it's coming from you. Right. And then this activity feed, this is another pro feature. It's awesome. It gives you transparency, gives you a little bit of peace of mind. You're sending out all these emails. You're posting these videos, posting your transcripts. This activity feed will tell you who's looking at you. So Boston University just viewed your highlight reel. Stanford University just viewed your academic transcript. We store all of that activity for you. You'll also receive email and text no message notifications when coaches are looking at you. Again, it's all to give you more transparency into what's going on in your profile and maybe who, who you need to be following up with or who's taken an interest in you. A lot of times when you're going to showcases, you'll end up getting a lot of views because college coaches, what they do on the sidelines if they're looking at, you know, they're watching a game and they want to know who number four on the blue team is, they're going to actually be coming into your sports recruits profile. That'll register a view so you can see which coaches were taking a look at you at an event. It's pretty cool. Definitely. All right. So the, the magic moment here, what everybody's waiting for. So if you already have a pro plan through your club team, you are all set. You do not need to upgrade. This has already been provided for you by your club. If you do not already have an upgrade, I'll walk you through your options here. We have four plans for families to choose from. All four of them provide full access to the Sports Recruits platform, all of those pro features that I just mentioned. The first plan is the pro subscription. So this is offered on either an annual basis or a monthly basis. Messaging system is unlocked. College coach views on your profile are unlocked. And then depending on your sport, the roster needs filter will be unlocked where you're able to see which schools are actively recruiting your position in your grad year. So that's the pro plan, $399 per year or $99 a month. The silver plan is the first of our lifetime memberships. Bear with me. This is where it gets a little complicated. This is lifetime. So you're not paying any annual fees if you have a silver or gold or platinum plan. So if you're a freshman and you purchase the silver plan, we're not charging you next year or the year after that. You have it all the way through college graduation, actually, in case you transfer. So the silver plan, lifetime access to pro features, we uh, will build you one highlight reel. So you have one professional highlight reel credit. You guys give us the footage. Our video team will put the isolation effects on it, music, title card, make it look really good. You are responsible for telling them uh, what clips you want included, what, you know, what parts of the video you want included and responsible for providing that footage. 
The strategy session is great. You're meeting with somebody like Mike, who's going to walk you through your recruiting process and really kickstart uh, the recruiting process for you. So helping you polish up your profile, walking you through a timeline, helping you even start picking out schools, answering sports specific questions that you guys have, probably talking a lot about scholarships like we have been tonight. So think of the strategy session as like a crash course in your recruiting process to get you going. Well said. And also for those of you who are, you know, maybe you've already started off the recruiting process and, and you're in a position now where you want to just more kind of just like rely on someone for additional support rather than just getting started. I would say a majority of people who sign up for that call is usually we don't know what to say. We don't know what to how to introduce ourselves, but we've also worked with a ton of families who have made significant progress, but really just kind of, kind of want to outline and lay out the success that they've had. Maybe there's offers that they're considering. So we, we really cater it to whatever part of the process that you're in at that point in time, just to, just to kind of note that. That's too. a really good point. Sometimes I know it's cheesy. And if you've been on a call with me, anybody on this webinar, I've probably said this. Think of it like if you were to join a gym and you have a personal training session, wherever you are in your recruiting process, the recruiting analyst will help you basically fine tune what's going to happen moving forward. So yeah. an opportunity to meet with somebody and kind of pick their brain. So then the gold plan is our middle tier. It's the most popular option. It's more hands-on than the silver plan. A lot of families say, okay, strategy session sounds nice, but what happens in two weeks when I have questions or I don't know what to say back to a coach? I don't know which camps to go to. If you have the gold plan, you have unlimited recruiting support via email. So you're able to reach out to our team of analysts and ask all of those questions that you have about scholarships, about camps, eligibility, which schools to reach out to, et cetera. You also would have two professionally built highlight reels instead of one with the gold plan. And then platinum's totally different. Again, my cheesy uh, comparison or uh, metaphor here. The pro plan is like joining a gym. Platinum's like having a personal trainer. You're paired up with a dedicated recruiting analyst who will be with you from day one till you graduate. So helping you with the timeline, picking out the right schools, prepping for phone calls, helping you with your emails, working with you through financial aid and scholarship. Mike, I know you don't only help families with athletic scholarships, but also academic aid and even helping them with FAFSA. So it's really encompassing the entire recruiting process when you have the platinum plan. And again, you're working with that dedicated analyst. So they know what your goals are. They know what you need the most help with. You're meeting with them directly, unlimited phone and video calls uh, with that plan, as well as unlimited professional highlight reels. So I would say the platinum plan is great for families who maybe this is their first time going through the process or are feeling overwhelmed and really want somebody to step in and, and kind of work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, exactly. And I'll drop my calendar link again for people who might've joined later. If you want to learn more about the options or really just talk through what makes sense for you guys as a family, schedule a call there. I'm happy to walk anybody through this. Yeah. And on top of that as well, um, I'll throw in a couple of links on my end too, that will take you to the NCAA's announcement of the settlement. And then also on top of that, an article that we wrote trying to detail this. So I know a lot of you, will, you know, if you watch this presentation tonight, you probably have a better idea, but if you do want to see it in written form, those are a couple of different places you can check for that also. Um, we have a few minutes left here, guys. We're going to try and answer as many questions as we could here. Um, so we'll just try and knock out as many of those as possible. And, and then we'll do our best to make sure that everyone comes out of this feeling more knowledgeable than they did before. Let's see. So it looks like one of the first questions that we received here was, uh, you know, talking about the impact on division two, if you missed it, we're not entirely sure how division two and division three are going to be impacted by this. We haven't seen any specific updates regarding that. We'll make sure to continue monitoring the situation and we'll, and we'll report back and we'll make that information available through articles, through blog posts, through social media posts. So just keep an eye. And if you're not following sports recruits on social media, that's going to be the best place for you to make sure that you find out about it as soon as we are releasing whatever we have found out. Um, and then so another person wrote in and, and to kind of go back to the, you know, the new roster limit model. This person is just looking to clarify. So scholarships are really still at school dis dis at school discretion, excuse me, for sports like lacrosse. Um, yeah, that's absolutely right. And that's really going to be across the board. So not even just lacrosse, but really any sport that, that is going to be, you know, a part of that particular athletic department. You know, we talked a little bit about, you know, schools potentially tiering the schools, uh, tiering <laughs> the programs, I should say. Um, you know, I mean, there's a athletic director, an athletic department that decides, hey, you know what, we want to be 
we want to be at the top of the country when it comes to baseball players and lacrosse players, that they are going to have the freedom to do that. Again, the, the, the negative side of that is they may end up taking away some resources from some other sports that may not be tiered the same way. So I think that's a good way just to kind of summarize it for anything. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So, okay. So I, I'm hoping that we didn't uh, confuse anyone here because another question that came in was, so does the scholarship limit actually drive the roster limit? So for example, they noted that men's lacrosse has a scholarship limit of 48. So it, it actually is a roster limit rather than a scholarship limit. So just to mm -hmm. clarify that one more time, that 48 number is the total amount of athletes that are allowed to be on a men's lacrosse roster. As for how many of those athletes or how much scholarship money those athletes receive, that is now going to be up to the athletic department rather than going by the limitations the NCAA have laid out for the current student athletes in 2024 and anyone prior to that. So hopefully that makes it a bit clearer if it wasn't. Uh, wasn't earlier. Let's see. Um, Caroline, this might be a good, it uh, looks like yeah. you're actually playing in about agree, uh, schools being able to see your favorites list and if they can see how you're like identifying them. But I think that's uh, worth, worth noting also. Yeah. So the question came in, can coaches see if you rank schools as a reach fit or safety on your favorites list? No, they can't. They can only see that you have favorited their school. Uh, you're interested in their school. That's a good one. Yeah. And then there, another question came in, can 2027s email coaches directly? Yes, you do not. There are no restrictions on you as the family reaching out to college coaches. They just can't contact you, um, Mike. If you yeah. Want to say I'll, on that. I'll throw another one at you, actually, as we'll just kind of keep it going here. Um, would it be wise to email all of the coaches that populate in the sports recruits messaging system, or should I just contact the head coach? And, and I see you feverishly nodding. So why don't you take that one too? Yeah. I mean, I, I think cover your bases, you know, yeah. it, usually it's an assistant coach, especially at a D one school who's handling recruit uh, like inbound recruits. The head coach gets involved a little later, but never hurts to get your name across a coach's desk. They might, you know, have a free minute. They want to watch your video. That's great, but definitely reach out to all the coaches on staff. Um, you, you know, cover your bases. Like I said. Yeah. I think we have time for one more here. Um, if you see one, Caroline, that you think we, that we haven't covered yet, feel free to let me know. But I'm just going to scroll through. It looks like we had some. I do have one. Somebody yeah. asked, how do you get email templates for sending yeah. out emails? So that's included in the silver, gold, or platinum plan. We have a whole library of email templates. I usually, and Mike, maybe you say something different to families, but I always say, think of those as like samples of what to say to coaches. You shouldn't be copy and pasting. You should personalize it for you uh, yourself as a student athlete, but it's a really great starting point so that you know how to structure your emails and a variety of scenarios. Yeah, I think that's well said. I think, um, yeah, I think more than anything, what we want to make sure that people kind of get out of this call is that you know, there, there is ways for you to kind of contact us for additional support. We wanted to make sure that, you know, more than anything, you guys have an outlet and a resource to look into whenever these types of questions do pop up. So as Caroline noted, schedule time with her. If you think yeah. you have someone who could benefit from, you know, even more of a, more of a specific conversation, we noted, we know that some people are probably asking more questions kind of specifically about their recruiting process start that conversation with Caroline and we'll do our best to make sure that we put you in the best position to succeed, especially if it is something where, you know, someone like myself or one of our analysts can, can assist you with that moving forward. Perfect. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone. Hopefully this was really helpful. I really appreciate everyone writing in saying that they enjoyed the presentation as well. That's always nice to see. Uh, we will do our best to make sure this recording becomes available um, as soon as possible, but it will be available at some point tomorrow for sure. Um, and yeah, just make sure you stay connected to us. Make sure you reach out. And if you ever see anything that you want us to report back on, or you see an article that, you know, has some information that you'd like to be further explained, just contact us directly and we'll, we'll do our best to help you make sense of everything. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks again.